Miss Sabine, can you brief, briefly summarize us your career and screenwriter? Um, yes, I came to Los Angeles in 1977 or 78 to start my career career. What had happened was I was living in Berkeley, California, and a friend of mine, and I was a, a fan of the movies, but I had never written a movie. And a friend of mine suggested that we make a script in which we adapted Kurosawa's stray dog to an American police, into an American policier. And we wrote the script in about 10 days and it was okay. When I read it, when I read it a few years later, I thought it was awful. But I, I, in writing it, I thought, I know how to tell a story in film. I, I can see that I've absorbed that kind of storytelling. And, and when some of my friends moved from Berkeley down to Los Angeles, they got me a job writing with one of them. You know, people in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, there were two kinds of people. There were the people who were good at getting jobs, and then there were the people who could write scripts. And often there were teams. One guy got the job and one guy wrote the script. Uh, and I was one of the script writers. And I had a partner for a very brief time who was a good job getter. And I wrote some scripts for that person. And then I got hired to write scripts for myself. Um, but I met my wife. Uh, she wasn't my wife yet, but we wrote a script together and we sold it. And then we both became employable. And then we wrote scripts. And I wrote scripts for 30, 35 years. Um, you know what they are, because I'm sure you've looked them up on IMDb. Uh, and, I, and I made a living doing that. <clears throat> and then after a while, I got tired of doing that. <clears throat> and the idea for The Believer came along. And I, uh, I made The Believer. Um, and that, that took me somewhat out of the business of doing Hollywood jobs. Um, and it spoiled me, if you know what I mean. Uh, before that, I was very grateful to have a job and I would try and make myself excited about whatever the subject was, but I was happy to get paid. And after The Believer, I wasn't as, getting paid wasn't enough for me anymore. Uh, and it became increasingly difficult to write jobs and to, to write scripts for other people when they did, they told me how they wanted them written. Um, and when the movie business sort of collapsed or the screenwriting business sort of collapsed around 2008, 2009, I started to drift away from Hollywood. Um, and, and I really, until right now, I haven't had a job. I, I did a couple more scripts, but I had a tremendously frustrating experience writing scripts. I would write scripts that I liked and that other people liked. And they would be made into movies that I hated, or more often they weren't made into movies at all. Uh, and, and finally, at a certain point in my life, I found it very hard to do it. And, and for the last three or four years, I've done nothing in Hollywood. But right at the moment, I'm working on a television show because circumstances occurred that made it appropriate for me. I mean, I wanted to, I needed to make some money and I wanted to find out what it was like to work on one of these modern television shows. So I took the job and I'm here in Los Angeles doing it now. How and why did you decide to write The Believer? It's a very funny story. Um, many years ago, 30, 35 years ago, a friend of mine who was a journalist in New York told me the story of Danny Balant, not Danny Balant, Danny Burroughs. I changed the name. He told me the story of Danny Burroughs. And Danny Burroughs was a kid in New York in 1965 who got arrested at a Ku Klux Klan demonstration in the Bronx. And the New York Times interviewed him and they sent a reporter out and they, Danny Burroughs had a very elaborate anti-Semitic theory 
And when the Times revealed to him that they knew he was Jewish, he said, if you print that story in the New York Times, I'll kill myself. And the Times printed the story that Sunday and Burroughs killed himself within an hour of seeing the newspaper. And my friend and I, the, the journalist, we were going to make a story, a movie about that. And it was a movie about somebody who was ashamed of being Jewish, who hid his Jewishness, who wanted to be a regular American and didn't want to be Jewish. And he took it to a crazy extreme. But we never did it. We talked about it for years and years and years. And in the course of those years, again, my wife becomes an important character. I met my wife. and My wife is from a much more religious Jewish background than I am. Her father was a rabbi. Um, it was a strange mixture because she, he was in the army. He was a rabbi in the United States Army. And she went to yeshivas and she grew up on army bases. And it was a strange thing. But she, I, from her, I learned a lot about Judaism. And I became interested in Judaism in a way I'd never been interested in it. And I began to see the story of Danny Burroughs not as the story of a self-hating Jew, but as the story of a rabbi monke, a guy who is a rabbi or a rebbe um, and who's practicing his Judaism without knowing that that's what he's doing. And I began to see the being of a Nazi as something very, for, for a Jew, as something very Jewish, something very dialectic, something about becoming your opposite as a way of completing yourself, of fulfilling not just being a Jew, but being a Jew and its opposite. And that became extremely compelling to me. And when I had that thought, this whole story came alive. And then a friend of mine who teaches film in New York City at, a, at Queens College in New York said, give me some of your old scripts. Give me a couple scenes out of one of your old scripts so that my students can make a film of it just to practice. And I said, well, you know what I'll do? I'll write a couple scenes out of this script I never wrote. So I wrote like five scenes out of The Believer. And when his students proved a little irresponsible, I ended up directing the film myself. The little, just five scenes, a little short, 13 minutes long. And I saw from that that the idea worked. That the idea of a guy who was a Jew and who was a Nazi, who was a Jew pretending to be a Nazi, that there was something strong, narratively, dramatically strong in that idea. And then I wrote the whole film and um, for some crazy reason, people were willing to finance it. I actually put up about a third of the budget myself. I, um, I, I was a highly paid screenwriter at the time and I got a, a job just for the purpose of funding my film. And then a producer, Peter Hoffman, uh, put up the other two thirds of the money, and that's how I made the movie. Did your Jewish origins play any role in such movie? Well, of course they did. Um, but but as I say, my Jewish origins, my Jewish education was practically there was practically nothing i was bar mitzvahed um but i knew nothing about judaism uh, i'd read some 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 of the old testament uh, i'd grown up in a family that was very aware of itself as jewish but there was no real religious content they we celebrated the holidays in a certain perfunctory fashion uh and our identification with the people of Israel was very strong, but we didn't think about the religion. When I married my wife and began to think about the religion, it was as if a secret content had opened up, something that it was new to me, but it was familiar to me. Um, my father is a lawyer and around the dinner table when I was a child, 
we would discuss legal questions. We would, my father would, in a certain sense, instruct us in legal reasoning. And when I began to read Jewish texts, and I would I began to read Midrash, and I would to read discussions among the rabbis about points of law, I saw how similar that thinking was to the thinking my father had taught us. And so I felt I was coming into a knowledge that I didn't have and yet that I was prepared for. So I found the reading of the sacred texts and the reading of the commentaries that went with them extremely exciting. Um, and it was that excitement which came to me in my 40s, really, my 30s and 40s, that prepared me for the experience of making the believer. It was because I'd been, and, and I think that no one who had grown up in a truly religious Jewish background would be likely to have made the believer. It would have seemed heretical or obscene or silly or obvious. But to me, it was new and fresh, and I was excited by it. And I was very, very excited about this idea that a person wanted to be, he was unsatisfied being a Jew. To be a Jew was just unspeakably provincial, um, parochial. And he thought when he was an adolescent, because he's a teenager, he thinks to be a Nazi, to be the thing that my parents hate and that my family hates and that my community hates, that's exciting. But after a while, being a Nazi was kind of boring. They were stupid. They didn't really have any ideas. But to him to be a Jew and a Nazi, to be a thing and its opposite, that had a certain fundamental excitement. And that drove him forward. And, and you're going to ask me a question later in your series, which is, why does he have to die? Uh, and, and, and the answer to that, as I understand it, is he's, he's trying to be a thing in its opposite, and that's vital and alive and exciting to him. But it's not stable. As soon as one side finds out about the other side, as soon as the Nazis find out that he's a Jew or the Jews find out that he's a Nazi, it's all going to come crashing down. So in a certain sense, he's living an impossible life. And when he comes to the point where the impossibility of that life confronts him or he confronts it, the only thing, the only choice left is self-destruction or to make a choice between these two sides of his life. But to go back to choosing one or the other is, is, is utterly unsatisfying to him. To be just a Jew or just a Nazi would be to be not alive. To be alive is to be both. But to be both is impossible. And therefore, when the impossibility, when you, when you confront the, the true impossibility, when you come to the point where it's impossible to go on being both, you no longer can be alive. So he destroys himself. Which are, according to you, the main points of Daniel Bailey's character? Um, he has a, he, the main points of his character. He has a passion for argument and debate and conflict. When he's with the Jews, he wants to tell them why they should be Nazis. When he's with the Nazis, he wants to convert them to Judaism. And when he's with himself, he's only content when these two sides of his nature are warring against each other. He, he thrives on conflict and conflict destroys him. Without the tension of conflict, he feels that he doesn't really exist, that he is just a gas that can disperse through the air and, and cease to be, have any form whatsoever. He also has a, a kind of rigor and a kind of integrity 
that makes it impossible for him to make the sorts of accommodations that allow most people to live their lives. You know, most of us, to live our lives, there are things we have to not look at. We can't look at how comfortable we are and actually remember how many people in the world are exploited or suffering so that we can have those comforts. If we think about that, life becomes impossible. But Danny is one of those people who cannot not think about the contradictions. He must think about them. And he takes a kind of adolescent pride in facing these contradictions. Now, he, he puts those contradictions in very uh, simplistic, binary terms, highly dramatic and unnuanced. Because again, as I said before, he's, he's in love with conflict. So, so this integrity pushes him toward facing these things, even though there's a kind of adolescent simplicity and vanity in that. Um, I, I think that and those, th those to me are the, the most important points of his character. He's fundamental, and, and like anybody like that, he's fundamentally lonely because he's cut off from other people, because his, 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 his compulsion is to always dispute and to argue and to set himself against other people, to be in dispute with them. So it's very hard for him to be with other people. Therefore, he's alone much of the time and in many ways, and, and, and he's alone in his head, and he lives in his head and in his construction of the ideas that are important to him in the world, and he doesn't experience the nuances and complexities and compromises of the world that are both compromises to our integrity, but things that make living life possible. For him, life is impossible. It takes him a while to arrive at the, the point in which it becomes literally impossible. But in some way, he's moving toward that point from the beginning of the movie. Do you think that um, Daniel Bennett's story can be set in another time or space? And, and, and let's add to that, could it be set in other categories? That is, it always, um, I always imagined while I was making this movie that you could make the Catholic version of this movie. You could make the black version of the movie. You could make the gay version of the movie. And, and, and sometimes in some places there are those. There are little fragments of those versions elsewhere in the world. Um, do you know Samuel Fuller's film Shock Carter? You know Samuel Fuller, the American B director. Do you know him? Yes. And he made a film called Shock Carter. Um, set in a mental institution. And in the men in, among the characters in the mental institution is a young black man who's, who has been one of the first black students to integrate a Southern American, an American, and a university in the Americans in the United States South. And in the movie, the black man spews racial invective, anti-black racial, he makes anti-black speeches the whole time, and it's part of his madness. And then there's a moment in the film where he's sane again, and he starts to explain what it was like being a student integrating a Southern university and all the hatred that was shouted at him. And he starts to imitate the hatred. He starts to say the things that were shouted, nigger this and nigger that, and he starts to say them aloud just to show what he went through. And then after a while, he forgets that he's saying them to show what he went through. And he becomes so much the people shouting at himself that he forgets well, who he is. That seems to me, in a little way, a black version of the movie I made. So I think there are many other groups you could say. Could you say it in another time and place? Sure, of course. The notion 
of a person set against himself, of a person who is only happy, or, or happy is not the right word, who, 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 who's, whose only vitality, whose only sense of being truly alive comes when, in a certain sense, he's fighting himself. That seems to me, you know, a fairly universal theme in any culture, in any time, um, maybe more modern, maybe more in the modern age than earlier, but certainly, is, you know, it's certainly there in other ages. When, when um, you know, when a Greek hero, when a Heracles goes mad and slaughters his family and then has to uh, do all of these labors to atone for his sin, the germ of that strikes me as similar. Again, a person who goes mad and destroys what he loves, and and then the rest of his life is about is about setting that right. Well, Danny can only set it right by, or he can only he, he because he's who he is. He can only set it right by destroying himself. If he were an older person, or if he had more options, or 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 if this were a, a more naturalistic story. Uh, he might find his way to a more integrated synthesis, to, toward, to a happier understanding of the complexity, so he could live with the contradictions. Um, but he doesn't get there.